I'd rather be here at church tonight than sitting at home nursing a broken rib. Amen? That's where Brother Sterling is. Yeah, poor old guy. Uh, he was bull riding and uh, got bucked off. And You don't believe that, do you? No, I didn't think so. Uh, I think it was something as serious as he was fixing... Um, He's got a trailer that he rents out, and I think they had a water leak under the sink. And them under-the-sink fixes are the hardest things in the world because you've got half of your body sticking in in this little bitty space trying to work, and your ribs are... I, so I don't know if that's what happened or what, but he's got a, he's got a busted rib. Those things hurt. The worst thing is to have a busted rib and a cough. Yeah, that's bad. So anyway, pray for him tonight and um, pray for people coming in. I think Peter's probably had the longest trip. What was that, 28 hours? Man. And it's like time travel at its worst because not only... Is he going backwards in time? He's shifting seasons. He's going from winter to summer. Because you want to blow your mind. Okay, where he came from, it was tomorrow. And he came back in time to yesterday. And he traveled through seasons going from winter to summer. Them Aussies are messed up, man. They eat Vegemite. That's what's wrong with them. Amen? Don't tell me you like that stuff. Oh, man. Like, 99 out of 100 Australians love Vegemite. One out of 15 million Americans can stomach it, all right? So, I still got my tube. So, and Bala keeps threatening to send me more. Uh, you pray for Bala and his family out in Redding, California with all those fires out there. And I stay in touch with him. So far, they're doing fine. So just pray for him. All right. Let's uh, take a Bible, turn to 1 Peter 3. We'll get into the word. We'll have a word of prayer. Then we'll study the word and then we'll have our prayer time uh, tonight. Got some other folks coming in tomorrow. Uh, some folks coming in Friday. Uh, a family wants me to do a baby dedication Sunday morning. So I'm looking forward to that. And um, so anyway, uh, praise the Lord. First Peter chapter 3. It's the end of the chapter. And um, verse 21. We, we were talking about Noah, the flood, and baptism. And he said the like figure... Whereunto, he's talking about the flood, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus is alive, but we don't see him now. He ascended in Acts chapter 1. He ascended in a cloud. And so what did... The angels say concerning Jesus in that cloud. They were all the disciples were standing there like. Because Jesus had went up in a cloud and the angels said. Why stand you gazing up into heaven? Shall so come again in like manner. The same Jesus. Not another one. That's a clue. That's a clue, I think, because I think that the world is going to be presented with two Jesuses, two Christs. They have their choice. Amen. And I think the Bible gives us enough so that those who believe the Bible will know and already do know the real one. It's like comparing a King James to an NIV. You're going. It's like comparing a real $20 bill to Monopoly money. Right? You're going. I, I can tell the difference. 
You look at it in IV, I can tell the difference. And when we see the other Jesus, I think we'll know. I think we'll be able to go, that's not, no, that's not him. There's going to be something about that, that God's people will know. Um, anyway, who's gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. He's the head. Amen. He's the, he's the, um, he's the angel of the Lord, the chief. He is the, uh, he's the great high priest. He's the chief apostle, the chief bishop, the chief shepherd, the chief prophet, the king of kings and lord of lords. Any office, he's at the top of all of them. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you, Lord, for gathering us into this place. Father, we ask for your blessings tonight as we study your word. We thank you for these that have gathered here, those that are gathering with us online. Father, we do pray for your traveling blessings upon all those lord that will be coming in the next few days we thank you lord for brother peter coming to us this week and we pray lord that you would just bless our fellowship with him his fellowship with us and father we look forward to this weekend lord we've i, I thank you lord for the church that has put so much work into this and i pray dear god that you would bless this church as a result of it bless those that are coming we pray dear god that you give them all traveling safety and Father, Lord, just draw us together, bind us together, Lord, with the words that are in this book. And we thank you for it so much, Father, for what you've done in our lives. Open up this word now to us. Open up your right hand, Father, and show us great and mighty things. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Uh, he, we pointed out last Wednesday night that Jesus is gone into heaven and he's on the right hand of God. And there is a reason for that. I explained a little bit last Wednesday night that the right hand is in the Bible. It's symbolic of strength and power. The left hand displaying weakness in the Bible. The right hand displaying power and grace. Jesus took, uh, if you take your Bibles very quickly, to Matthew 25. You see, and we pointed this out last uh, last Wednesday night, but very quickly, uh, when Jesus in verse 31 of Matthew 25, when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left. And then if you look down to verse 44, then shall they answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger or thirst or a stranger or naked or prison and did not minister unto thee, then shall he answer them saying, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did not, did it not unto, not to one of the least of these, ye did it not for me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. It's talking about the goats on the left, but the righteous, into life eternal. So there we see in that illustration there the difference between the, how, how God is displaying for us the left hand versus the right hand. So Jesus goes to the right hand of the Father. He is there. And what is he doing right now? What is Jesus doing at that right hand right this minute? He is making intercession. He is the mediator, the intermediary. The one who goes and speaks to his father for us. And he's the only one. Amen. There's not two. There's not three. There's not 365 of them. One for each day. There is not a different mediator. There is only one mediator. You and I, because Jesus came down here and lived our life and became human. Then we can talk to Jesus but we cannot talk to the Father. We are unclean, we are undone, we are defiled, and we cannot go, and I am, I'm dead serious about this. I learned this on my own. I mean, I've heard people say in Jesus' name all my life, but I never really had someone say, when we pray, you must pray through Jesus, or you're not praying. 
And I believe that when we pray, we pray through Jesus in his name to Jesus and Jesus then takes that to the Father. Nobody, nobody has the right to go directly to God and address him. None of us do. The Israelites, when, when God began to talk to them from Mount Sinai, and all he did was read those Ten Commandments. The Israelites told Moses, tell him stop. If he keeps talking, we're going to die. They were in such terror at hearing the voice of the Lord. And so right then, Moses then becomes the mediator. They said, Moses, you go talk to God. Whatever God says, we'll believe you. And then we'll receive it. And then if we want you to tell, talk to God, we'll tell you, you talk to God. So Moses is acting the type of Christ there. But nobody has the right to go directly to God. One of the, one of the things that I teach against uh, that we've never encountered it here, nobody's ever brought it up here, but it's been brought up time and again in these other churches, is what's called contemplative prayer. And it says that you close out everything out of your mind, you shut down all the thought processes of your mind. And you go into a deep meditation, and you are going to talk to God who is on the inside of you. Now here's the thing. You don't have to be a Christian to do this, they say. Anybody can do this. Anybody can talk to that God that is on the inside of them. And what it is, you are talking directly to God and God is talking directly to you. Here's the problem. They're teaching people to bypass the mediator, Jesus Christ. And they're saying that they can talk directly to God who is on the inside of them and that God will whisper back to them or that God will speak in silence to them. God will speak in silence to them. What's the problem with God speaking to us in silence? He's not saying anything. But the funny thing is, they say that there's more profound things you're going to get from God in silence than you would if he was actually speaking. That's dumb. That's ignorant. And that's dangerous. If you look in the scriptures and see, especially in the book of Psalms, David said, Lord, do not be silent to me. Lest if you are silent to me, I be like those who go down into the pit. Dun, dun, dun. Okay? So that's the danger of it. So Jesus has to be on the right hand of the Father, and he is, he is hearing our prayers, receiving them, giving them to his Father. The Father then is answering because he loves the Son, and he loves us, and he is answering those questions according to his riches and according to his mercy. So we were looking at the right hand. There's two of them there. Not two right hands. But two hands, uh, and I made mention last Wednesday that each hand contains 27 bones. That's the number of books in the New Testament. So when, and when Jacob was blessing Manasseh and Ephraim, he was giving them the new covenant blessing. He was blessing them with the New Testament. Uh, turn to Revelation 5. Let's read this for a minute. Revelation 5 is going to set the theme... And it's going to give the purpose of what we're going to study after this. So Revelation 5, verse 1. I have verse 1 up on the screen, but let's read a little bit of this. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside that's exactly identical to the Ten Commandments. The two tables of stone were written on the front and on the back side. Written within and on the backside, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? No man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto weep, saith unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, 
hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Now, I know that sounds a little bit weird. We have a lamb and he has seven eyes. Okay, we're not used to seeing that. Uh, we're not used to seeing a lamb with seven horns. But those, those seven horns and those seven eyes have meaning. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Samson was a picture of this, having seven locks of hair. His seven locks were the seven horns of Jesus. So those seven locks represented what? The seven spirits. And when Delilah cut off those seven locks, what does Samson then have for strength? And boy, doesn't the devil want to cut off the seven locks. Amen. So verse seven, and he came, I think it's interesting. It's verse seven. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb. Look at that. Just, just taking the book. Just taking the book. And when he did that, uh, in Ezra, when Ezra took the book and he stood up to read the book, when he opened the book in the sight of all the Jews that were gathered there, they all stood and said, Amen, Amen. And he hadn't said anything. There was, it was such an amazing thing that now after 70 years, Somebody is opening the book once again to these people. And that was such an amazing thing to them because those people have been 70 years without anybody reading the Bible to them. And here they are and Ezra stands behind that pulpit of wood and he takes that book and he opens that book and they all stood in reverence and said, Amen, Amen. And they listened to him. They listened to Ezra do nothing but just read that book. Well, that's something, amen? What's missing out of your life if you're not reading the book? Amen? So they, they uh, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people. And nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth now So that sets the tone then for What we're gonna what we're gonna look at tonight because we're going to see in the scriptures The power that's in God's right hand The power that's in God's right hand. So if Lindsay asked me what I'm going to title this because she always asked me, Dad, what's the title for the sermon? And I'm going to say, The Power in God's Right Hand. So turn to Exodus 15. Exodus 15. Exodus 15 is right after Exodus 14. Isn't God amazing? Exodus 15 is right after the Red Sea came crashing down upon Pharaoh. And so look at what the song of Moses says. In fact, let's read the first six verses of Exodus 15. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. I, now I'm going to stop right here. I'm one of these that believes that if it's going to be called Christian music, it ought to name the name of the Lord in it and not call him a you. There was, believe it or not, the Dove Awards. You know what those are? Christian music award ceremony. And they give it out to Christian artists, Southern Gospel, uh, Contemporary Christian music they give awards out every year to the best song best composer best singer best band whatever 
And the committee that was doing this got tired of the songs that were being submitted and the songs that were being sung, even though they were popular. There was nothing in them, a lot of them, that had anything to do that sounded anything like Christianity. That never mentioned God, never mentioned the Lord, never didn't mention anything. So the committee said, they set a bare minimum standard. A bare minimum. That in order for us to give an award to a particular song, then we want a certain real Christian content to it. It has to sound uniquely Christian in its lyrics. Did you know that those singers and composers and bands threw a fit? They said, that's censorship! And they, you know, that talk. That's not censorship. They're not saying nobody can listen to it. They're just saying, if you want us to pat you on the back and give you a prize, then we're asking that you make it sound Christian. Amen? And it was. They threw a fit over this thing. And they threatened to boycott the double. And I'm going, boycott them. Don't give them an award. Amen? But that's the condition. And that's been, that, my goodness, that's been 15 years ago that that happened. Okay? How much worse is it now, do you think? Yeah, amen, Sister Linda. She knows. Okay? So anyway, they're singing a song. And... Um, uh, look, I got to go back. I say that I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider have thrown in the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. So if you're going to sing about Jesus, sing about Jesus. Don't sing about some guy that could be your boyfriend. Amen. The Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. He is my God and I will prepare him in habitation. That means God, I'm going to make room for God to live in my life. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord. Now this is why we looked at what was in God's right hand. It was the book. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. What's in God's right hand? The book. What is it that will dash your enemies in pieces? The book. What is it that will give you power that you didn't have yesterday? The book. What is it that keeps us going? The book. Where's our strength? The book. Where was Samson's strength? The seven locks. The seven locks are the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God are in this book. Amen? So that's, that's, the, that's the idea behind this. Every time you see something about God's right hand, it's not just his hand sitting there. It's the book in that hand. That's where the power comes from. You have your enemies. You have three of them. Lust of the flesh, I, it sounded like it was my phone. I'm going, where's that? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Those are your enemies. How are you going to have victory over them? Right hand of God. What's in the right hand of God? The book. And it always, I'm just telling you, it always works that way. Deuteronomy 33, turn there. Deuteronomy 33. This is another uh, song Moses sings, I think. This is a blessing that Moses gives. Deuteronomy 32 is the song. 33 is the blessing. And let's read in verse 1. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai, rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of of saints. I like that. That's us. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That's Revelation 19. That's going to be us. We're going to be coming back with Jesus. So he came with ten thousands of saints 
From his right hand went a fiery law for them. So what, with, with what hand did God write the Ten Commandments? His right hand. He writes them with his right hand. Why? That's the strength. That's the power. Okay? Uh, let's see. Yeah, verse 2. Yea, he loved the people. All the saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy words. But from his right hand went a fiery law from that. Whoever made that, who was it? Cecil B. DeMille that made that Ten Commandments? He got that part right. That fire, I, that was great special effects for 1950, whatever that was. And it looked like just a cartoon, but it was fire coming in and... And I'm going, that's pretty cool. Okay, but that part they got right. It was a fiery law that came forth from God's right hand. He wrote it with his, oh, with the Bible says, with the finger of God, he wrote that. Okay? One, two, three bones in my finger. Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And these three are, okay? Amen. Turn to, now turn to Psalms, because the next 90 verses I read is going to be out of the book of Psalms. Uh, seriously. Maybe somebody could look up the phrase right hand in the book of Psalms and tell me how many times it's there. Because it's in there a bunch. Okay? This is my favorite. Psalm 1611. It's my favorite one. Okay? Psalm 1611. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Where's the path of life? It's in 1611. <laughs> it's in 1611, amen? Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Just to, be, just to be asking, when's the last time that you got in the presence of God and you were just tickled to death? Have you ever, has that ever happened? You were just happy. You were reading your Bible, and God said something to you while you are reading your Bible, and you just got happy. Amen? Nothing wrong with that, okay? Uh, in thy presence is fullness of joy. In fact, you're, you can get joy from this world, but you won't get fullness of joy. You get joy from being in... In the presence of God. And that joy is full. It will make you full. It will satisfy you. The way nothing else in this world satisfies you. I like to laugh. I like funny jokes. So, in my younger years, I used to watch sitcoms on TV. Funny shows. And just laugh. Okay? The older I get, I just don't, number one, they're more dirty than they are anything, and I don't think they're funny anymore. But if I want joy, I will get, I'm not just making this up because I'm the preacher, I will get joy being in God's presence when I'm in his word. There's a joy in this book that satisfies you, that makes you complete. It's fullness of joy. And then it says, at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Again, in our youth, we may have gotten our pleasures from this world. We don't, the older we get, the less pleasurable they are, right? It's, it's more of, you're either addicted to something, or you can't quit something, or it's just not like it used to be anymore, or whatever. It's just kind of run its course. But at thy right hand, which means the book at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. You will read a passage of Scripture 20 times, and on the 21st time, you'll see something you never saw there before, and it made you happy. And it gave you a deep down pleasure. And then you realize that God just opened your eyes to something. He opened your awareness to something. 
And then you said, God, why did you give that to me? I'm, I'm worthless. I'm guilty. God, I'm no good. God just says, because I love you. And you were seeking pleasures, and I just thought I would give you some pleasures. Amen? But it's at the right hand of God. It's in that book at the right hand of God. Next chapter over, Psalm 17, verse 7. Shew thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. Now there's a lot here. Number one, you're not saved without the book that's in God's right hand. You cannot be saved without, I, I am I'm stuck on this. And I hear, I hear about people, oh, we had, a, we had a contemporary Christian music concert. We had 400 people come down and get saved. I, I'm not the judge. But I, I, I'll tell you this. And this came out a few years ago. Some of these guys in these rock groups don't even believe in God. One guy came out. He was in one of these contemporary rock groups, Christian rock groups. And he gave an interview because he was coming out saying, I'm an atheist. And of course, shockwaves reverberated everywhere because he would say, you know, he said, we'd be doing these concerts. And of course, they tell us, you know, now at the end, have a little altar call and this and that and the other. And so they'll have this weak altar call and these kids will come down or whatever. And when the people go to meet him after the concert, they're all wanting, he said, they're all coming to me, wanting me to pray for them. And he said, I wasn't going to tell them right then that I didn't even believe in God. But I didn't believe in God. And don't. And he said, so I would always try to, some way of getting out of it, like, you know, I'd rather pray in private or whatever. Maybe have so-and-so pray or whatever. And he said, I would always dodge it. But here I was playing this music, didn't believe in God. And most of the other guys I played with didn't either. But they were singing Christian music and people were getting saved. I don't think so. Again, I'm not everybody's judge. It's not a broad brush I'm painting it. But I'm just saying. They can't be born again if there's no incorruptible seed. Okay. It's it's. It would be like saying it would. Be like another virgin birth. Okay. There was no man involved here, but she's pregnant. I don't believe that. Somebody's lying. Amen? Okay? If, if God's word was not present, there cannot be a born again experience. You see what I'm saying? It's got to have the seed of the word of God. And so he says, O thou that savest by thy right hand. That's the first thing. Second thing. Them that put their trust in it. Did Jesus die for everybody? Yes. Does that mean then, then everybody gets to go to heaven? No. The key is they have to put their trust in that right hand book. They've got to believe what God said. They've got to put their trust in that. I preached that at Charles Forsyth's funeral. I said, that, and that's what God gave me. He trusted God. He trusted God. This man lived most of his life not saved. But at some point, the word of God went into him. And he knew that he needed to trust God for his salvation. And he trusted God for his salvation. And that's just how it is. If you don't put your trust in God, in, in God's right hand, you're not saved. From those that rise up against them. Again, you're always going to have enemies. Your greatest enemies are not the people around you. Your greatest enemies are not necessarily the principalities and powers. Your greatest enemies are your own sins. Those are your greatest enemies. They will try to rise up against you. You then must put your trust in God and not in the power of your flesh. Because it will fail you. Psalm 18, next chapter over, verse 35. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. That goes to Ephesians chapter 6. The shield of faith, wherewith we can quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Thou hast given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. 
when the evil day comes and it's coming will we be holding up will we be standing by our own strength and power so don't fear don't fear because you know I mean let's have the scenario that they're gonna put a gun to your head George and they're gonna say Will you confess Jesus? Will you deny him? Because if you don't deny him, we're going to blow your brains out. Oh, no, no, no. If you don't deny Jesus, we're going to kill your wife and all your family in front of you. And you kill me. I can handle that. But you threaten to kill my family in front of me. That's going to be tough, right? Will I be able to hold up on that day? Well, thank God... He's the one going to hold me up. So people, it's not going to depend on your strength in that day. God is going to hold you up so that you don't fall in the evil day. Amen? He's the one. And what hand is holding you up? The one with the book in it. By this book that we're still standing today. This book and nothing else. If I were to ask you tonight, how many of you have been good now this whole month of August? Today's the first day, right? I won't ask. What about July? July? How much righteousness did you accumulate in July? None. None of your own. So again, if we were to count on our own stamina, our own ability, yeah, if they put a gun to my head, I'm going to confess Jesus. Yeah, but what if they put a gun to your granddaughter's head? Because that's how they do it in the movies, right? I ain't killing him. I'm going to kill your family. You're going to give me the combination of the safe? Right? I mean, if it was, they wanted the combination of my safe at home, they said, we're going to shoot you. Well, you shoot me, you don't get the combination. Well, then fine, we'll shoot your family. Hang on. I'll give it to you. Okay? But I'm just saying to you, whatever scenario comes about, I don't know what's going to happen. Whatever scenario comes about, God's holding you up with his right hand. And it's his gentleness. He's gently holding you up. Boy, that's good. Amen. Psalm 20. Wow. Yesterday you didn't know this, but you know it today. Now, Psalm 20, verse 6. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. How did he save you? His right hand. What's in his right hand? The book. Psalm 21, verse 8. Thy, oh, here's, I like this one. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Now, let's go back now. What are your enemies? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Okay? How would we know... What it is that we're not supposed to do if we didn't have what was in God's right hand. We wouldn't. You see, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect and truly furnished into all good works. So it's the book that tells us what's right to do and what's wrong to do. It's the book that judges us. Mike, you did wrong. How am I doing wrong? Well, it says right here in the book, you did wrong. I guess I did wrong then. And people accuse me of heresy. People accuse, and I have quoted scripture and people have accused me of heresy. I'm not kidding you. These, these people, these, I don't know where they come from on this. Uh, repentance is not part of salvation. And if you teach repentance, you're teaching work salvation. And so I'll quote the scriptures. For godly sorrow worketh 
salvation, repentance unto salvation that need us not be repented of. I'll quote the verse and they'll say, see, you're a heretic. But I quoted scripture. Okay? I don't get it. But, where was I going with that? Anyway. Thy hand shall, where was, what verse was I in anyway? 20, 21, 8. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. So we learn what's right and what's wrong. We learn what doctrines are right to believe and what doctrines are wrong to believe. If it's not in the Bible, it doesn't exist. And if it is in the Bible, then we are to believe it. We maybe not understand it, but we are to believe it. People will try to pile on sins on you. They will try to add things to you to say, are you doing this? Well, then you're doing wrong. Are you doing that? Then you're doing wrong. But if the Bible doesn't say this or that is wrong, then it's not wrong. And God's not going to hold us accountable for anything that's not in his book. But the more you read this book, the more you find out that you're not as good as you once thought you were. Because you'll find out that you've been doing something wrong for years and never knew it. And, but you, were re you read it in a book. And you're like, man, I've been doing this wrong all these years. I mean, God, why didn't you throw me in hell? Because God says, I'm long-suffering with you. And I knew that you were, I was going to wait until this day to show you this. And now that I've shown you this, we're going to work on that in your life. I'm going to clean you up. I'm not going to cut off. I'm, going to, I'm not going to purge all the dead branches all in one day. We're going to work on this for a while. When we get that worked on, then we're going to work on this for a while. And that's how God does it. He doesn't just all at once. It's a little bit of here, a little bit of there. But we find out what our enemies, and I'll, I'll say this. You can be in situations where... There's something going on and you can feel it in your spirit and you don't know what it is. And God will show you in the book not only what it is, but who it is. I've had that happen more than once. God will show you people that are pretending to be your friend, but are not your friend. He'll show you your enemies. Thy right hand shall find those out. Psalm 44, 3. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword. Again, the land is heaven. It is our inheritance. We're not going to gain it by our own battles, by our own will, by our own ability to fight. Neither did their own arm save them. Underline that in your Bible. But thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them so god put his favor on you god's going to save you and so god is going to save you with his right hand you're going to gain heaven by what is in god's right hand there is a there is a title deed to heaven and god has written your name in it that gives you access to heaven. You can go in there because your name is written in God's book and he's holding it in his right hand. Amen. Uh, Psalm 45. Man, I'm on a roll here. Psalm 45, verse 4. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things what does the word terrible mean here does it mean yeah that's terrible huh great, great. okay the word terrible means that it is so great that it like shocks us with terror when they heard God's voice coming to them from Mount Sinai. You think they were all happy about it? They were shaking in their sandals. Because God's voice struck terror in them. That's why they asked Moses. Moses, from now on, tell him, don't talk to us. And so God, that, from that point, God never did that again. But anyway, uh, thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. God is going to show you things in the Bible... That's going to that's jar you. 
it's going to shock you. I've had those moments where I'm reading the scriptures and I, or I'm chasing something down in Bible and I'm looking on using the Bible search software and I'm looking verse to verse, line upon line, line upon line, and I hit something and it just boom and I I will. I'll scoot back and I'll just go, whoa. And I'll have to sit there for several minutes soaking that in. When Daniel heard uh, what was it he heard? He heard something. Oh, when, when Daniel got the meaning of the dream, said it put him in awe for, what, half an hour or something like that. He just sat there and went. Because it was so terrible going into him, it just froze him. You're going to read, especially now, I believe that between this day and here's the Lord appearing in the air. Between these two days, as we get closer to this day, things that we're going to find out from God's word is going to shock us. And they've been there all along. But I think we're going to see things that we've never seen before. And understand things because we live in this particular generation. Generation before us, they learned things for their generation. Same way. It made them, made them stand in awe. Made them, it shocked them. It put terror in them. But in our generation, it's the same. We're, we see things because we can see things now that that generation couldn't see and understand. We, we know what the book is in Psalm 139, 16. In thy book, all my members were written. Nobody knew that 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Nobody knew what that meant. Now we know what it, we look at it and we go, that's DNA. And now we know this thing about they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. We're going, we know what that is. And we read things on the news that make us go, oh, are you kidding me? We read things now in the Bible that are terrible to us, but we get them from God's right hand. Uh, Psalm 48, 10, according to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand, I like it, thy right hand is full of what? Righteousness, meaning the left hand is full of leftiness. Come on, that was funny. Shake your head at me, Linda Carmichael. Your left hand is full of leftiness, Right? George, that's funny. Okay, you get it, all right. A, a drink and a sandwich? I can tell where your mind is. It's after eight. You guys are ready to go party, aren't you? <laughs> all right. <laughs> when Paul said that the scripture is instruction in righteousness, he means it. God will tell us, men, that it's wrong to do certain things. And that it's right to do certain things. God will tell ladies, ladies, it's wrong to do certain things. It's wrong to do this. It's wrong to dress this way. Amen. Can I say that? Listen, you know, I'm not trying to be legalistic or anything like that. But when you read this Bible, God will teach you how to dress. God will tell you ladies how to dress like a lady. And God will tell you men how to dress like a man. I'm a man. A man. God will teach you what um, modesty is. Your heart will be right. And you will, all of a sudden you'll be changing things in your life. And nobody's having to tell you to do these things. It's because there's something in you now that wants to do things right. I've seen men in my lifetime, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. In the 70s, all these guys were having their, had grown their hair long. And now these same guys can't grow hair. <laughs> it's funny, you know. But they were all growing their hair long, and I saw them. I saw them, they come in, they get saved, and nobody had to preach anything to them. All of a sudden, two weeks after they got saved, is getting a haircut. Why? Nobody said they had to get a haircut in order to join the church. They, that's just what God put, they just wanted something different. Remember Larry Ziegler, 
big old bushy bearded guy. He was a drywall hanger. And when he got saved, I mean, he got saved and all of a sudden the hair come off. And I went, Harry! I actually liked the beard better because he was, yeah, he needed the beard. But anyway, it just, nobody had to tell him these things. He just wanted to dress right. He wanted to be right, okay? Uh, Mike Henderson is another one. When Mike Henderson got things right with God, he had this big long ponytail down halfway down his back. I never said a word to the man. And next thing I know, he comes in, he's got the ponytail cut off. He's cleaned up. And I'm just saying, thy right hand is full of righteousness. You read this Bible, and God starts cleaning things up in your life. Psalm 60, verse 5, that thy beloved may be delivered. Save with thy right hand, and hear me. Psalm 63, 8, my soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. There it is again. Psalm 73, 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast hold me up by my, by my right hand. God's right hand, holding on to your right hand. Amen? I got a couple more here. Psalm 74, 11. Oh, I like this. Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? Pluck it out of thy bosom. You remember Moses? Moses is going to go talk to Pharaoh and he wants signs and God said I'm going to give you signs Moses put your hand in your bosom so Moses puts his hand in his bosom and God said pluck it out what's that verse say pluck it out of thy bosom that hand was Jesus because Jesus in John 1 is that is in the bosom of the father and when he cut when Moses plucked it out the first time what did it have on it it's leprous as snow when Jesus came the first time all the sins of if everybody was laid on him, right? So God said, Moses, put it back in your bosom. So he puts it back in his bosom. See, now Moses pluck it out again. When he plucked it out again, it was clean. That's because when Jesus comes the second time, he's coming without sin. And that was the sign. And God said, Moses, if they won't believe the first sign, Jesus coming the first time, they'll believe the latter sign. And that right hand, why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand, pluck it out of thy bosom. That means God, or Jesus, come down from the Father and come down to us. We need some right hand in our life. Amen? We need some right hand in our life. Psalm 77, 10, and I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Uh, that means that when you're in distress, go back in your Bible and look at all the ways that God saved people out of their distresses. Psalm 78, 54, he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, which his right hand had purchased. Remember Jesus at the right hand. How did God purchase our salvation? He did it with Jesus at his right hand. Psalm 80, verse 15, And the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted. What's the vineyard? People, the church. How did God plant the vineyard? With what? What seed did he use? The seed that's in his right hand. That's how he, he used the book in his hand. The seed is the word of God. And it was what was in his right hand that he planted that became the vine and the branches. The vineyard which thy right hand hath planted and the branch that thou made strong for thy... That branch is Jesus. Or actually it's us. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Okay? And that, that thou made us strong for thyself. So the right hand of God with the book planted the vine, which became Christ and all the church people. And he did it with his right hand. You just can't get away from that book, amen? Let's stand to our feet.